All right, hopefully you've had a chance to get some coffee, say hello to somebody, get her picture out by that little beautiful picture spot that the girls made. It's wonderful seeing our kids chase around Easter eggs at Lake Walk yesterday. That was so fun. Thank you, everybody, for helping. It was so special. You counted three seconds? It is. It's like feeding fish or feeding ducks. It's like a frenzy of kids pushing, shoving. It's great. It's great. When For a little while, we had a, bought a little parsonage that we were using as our church offices, and we had ducks. Does anybody remember the ducks that we had? We had Sundar, and, you know, we had a, which one? Faraday, and I forget the other ducks' names. But I, I fed them some bread, and these ducks just went like kind of, they're kind of attacking that bread. And I was like, those greedy little ducks. And, and you know, you say something, and you're just like, you look, there's this little thing that we say is that you always see people the way you are, right? And so, like, you see these ducks crowding in for bread, and you're like, man, he's not sharing at all. And uh, those greedy little ducks, basically, if I was doing it, that's what I would be doing. I'd be pushing people out. And, and, and the Lord very gently said, Eli, my creation is not greedy. And I was like, hmm, never occurred to me that your creation isn't selfish. You know, it, it was a, and I said, so what is it, God? And he says, um, my creation understands value. Is that when something's valuable, you go for it. And if it's not valuable, if you don't see it as valuable, you'll die. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then we're going to go to Philippians chapter 2. And everyone pray for me that God will help us. We're going to start in chapter 15, verse 3. This is Paul telling the Corinthian church what gospel that he told them. And he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, then the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. In about A.D. 29, A.D., the, not A.T., not eight zero A.D., Anno Domini, uh, A.D. 29, Jesus died. At around 33 years old, the facts are uncontested. Everyone agrees that Jesus died, A.D. 29. It says that Jesus preached the gospel. Now, the word gospel, we get from the Anglo-Saxon word God's spell. You probably have heard of the play called God's spell. So the gospel was God's spell, and the word spell was the word story. So God's story. So preaching the gospel is preaching God's story. But before it meant God's story, the word simply meant the euangelion, the, the Greek word for gospel, meant good news. I remember meeting with Eric in Starbucks, and he goes, he's talking to me about the gospel. And, and sometimes when people talk to you about the gospel, uh, the good news, you can tell that maybe they're not sure what the good news is. And so I said, Eric, what's the good news? And he said, Jesus died. And I said, that's terrible news. <clears throat> and he said, uh, would he rose again? I'm like, it's better news. But it says that Jesus was preaching the good news before he died. So what was the good news that he preached before he died for the purpose that he died? So to do that, we got to start back over to the very, very, very bad news. And, and you have probably heard many, many dozens of times in your life, um, it is possible that there's one or two that have 
very rarely heard this, but let me just sum it up with a real simple. God had put Adam and Eve in the garden, and he told Adam not to eat from this one tree. He gave them every other tree they could eat from and said, don't eat from this one tree. And, of course, you know the story, the slippery little snake, the serpent, the shining one comes in and says, it's okay. The day you won't surely die, the day you eat of it, uh, you'll, you'll be like God. You'll know the difference between good and evil. And, and Eve, she was deceived, and then she went to her husband, Adam. And some of you who've read the story real close will remember that we know for sure that Adam received the commandment, and we're not sure that Eve heard it herself. So it appears that she had to hear it from Adam. But nonetheless, it says that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not, and Adam ate the fruit. And what he did is, if we just sum it up, uh, very, very simple, is he did what was right in his own eyes. He leaned on his own reasoning, except instead of the reasoning of the God who made him. And the Bible says often, it says in Proverbs 3, it says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And that lean not on your own understanding. Right there is the difference between everything that we see that's going wonderful in the world and everything that we see that's going poor. If history tells us one thing, if you look over the last just few years of history that you can remember, if history tells you one thing, it'll tell you this, that anybody who leans on their own understanding ends up causing a lot of damage in the world. And anyone who leans not on their own understanding, but says, I need wisdom that's bigger than me, they end up doing pretty good. But you go back to the beginning, and this replacing, this stepping out of, of doing what's right in God's eyes and doing what's right in your own eyes. Um, I, I, did a, I did a study, and, and it's in Genesis chapter 26. The Bible says that Abraham obeyed God's voice. It says, Abraham obeyed my voice, and he kept my statutes, my ordinances, my commandments, and my law. Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my statutes, my ordinances, my commands, and my law. And when I was reading this, I thought, it says that you said something, but when you said something, some of it was called a statute, some of it was called an ordinance, some of it was called a command, And some of it was called a law. So it says, Abraham obeyed God's voice, but when God spoke, not everything was called a command. Does it make sense? Some things were called, oh, charge. That's some versions say charge. Um, Commandments, statutes, and laws. And I want to just focus for a little bit on, on what makes something a commandment. So there's statutes, there's charges, there's law. Um, some of you might not know this, but it says Abraham kept the law right there. He, he kept his law, but there was no law given yet. The, the Jews called the first five books of the Bible the law, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the law, Moses' law. But Abraham didn't have that law to keep, so what was the law that he was being obedient to? And some of you would be surprised to know this is that the word law, before it meant what we know, of, it's mannerisms. It's a... Uh, it's uh, when God come to a table, what were his mannerisms? Uh, did he stand up and pull the seat out and let the lady sit and then shove it in? Uh, did he put his napkin over his left knee? Uh, some of you know uh, that, that women, when you go to a nice restaurant or just, you know, nice manners, your napkin will go over your lap. And a guy's napkin will go over his left knee, I think unless it's shellfish or some other things like that, then you kind of tuck it in. Now... <clears throat> There are certain times when it's okay to, to um, cut with your one hand and eat with the other hand, uh, fork, uh, but it has to be the right meals. Now, those kids that have taken cotillion, you would know and you'd be able to correct me. Uh, and if you go to a fancy restaurant and you're going to have a meal with God, how do you behave yourself with the God of the universe, and that's the word law, that's the word mannerisms. So what is God like? Isn't that great? But let's focus on the word commandment. When is something called a commandment? A father gives you different things to do. Some things might be a chore. 
right? A chore, you could understand what it is. A chore would be to clean your room. A chore would be uh, for my kids to uh, pick up dog waste in the backyard. Uh, a chore would be any number of things. And those are things that you got to do every day, i.e. make your bed. And everyone can understand what it means to make your bed because it's like, yeah, I want you to make your bed. I understand, Father. I will make my bed. If you can understand it and the reasoning why, it's generally called something like a statute or a charge. But if you can't understand the why, if the reason for the why is bigger than you are able to understand right now. So example would be to a kid, you say, don't touch that stove. And the kid says, why? <clears throat> and you say, because the upper layer of your epidermis will separate from the lower layer of your epidermis, will fill with the fluid and become a thing called a blister. Now, your kid who doesn't know what epidermis means, upper or lower, doesn't know what blister is. Your kid who doesn't understand all the ramifications of what happens when they get burned, they may not understand anything. Their kid is like, why are you so mean? Uh, so what you say is, don't touch <clears throat> with an emphasis of some sort of something they do understand. Or I'll spank you. <gasps> and that's a commandment. A commandment is when God tells you something that is above your current ability to understand the why. And for the sake of your welfare, he tells you to do something so that you don't trust in your own limited reasoning, but you trust in his divine reasoning. And that's why it's called a commandment. Does it make sense? So Adam and Eve, they didn't have to know enough. They didn't have to know all the ramifications of what happened when you choose to be selfish. But they did have to understand this very simple thing. Is the God who made me, I want to trust his reasoning or I'll trust my own. And that little thing, if you lean on your own understanding of things, that little thing is called an independent spirit. And all of history shows a great cost that all this world has paid when you have people that lean on their own understanding instead of God's. What I mean by this is they lean on their own understanding. They, they disavow someone who's gone before them that has a lot more wisdom. They disavow someone who's gone before them who has treated them quite well. They disavow someone who's gone before them who has given them the actual abilities they have. They disavow that and say, because I don't understand it, I want to be able to lean on how I do things. I want to be able to trust in myself. And from that little simple, what seems so innocuous at the beginning, bit by bit by bit has turned out to be every, every great travesty we've ever seen can come back to someone leaning on their own understanding and pushing off the voice of a God who's been speaking things to their conscience so that they can live. I'm reminded by one of my favorite authors who says, God whispers in our pleasures, he speaks to our conscience, and he shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And how often when, when something feels so good, Ecclesiastes says, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. When you're experiencing pleasure or something desirable, when you're, there's a whisper that says that there is, there is there's a God in heaven, there's a way of things. There's a whisper that says, be cautious here. It's a whisper in your pleasure that says, this, this particular way of doing things will hurt you. There's a whisper there, and that whisper often goes ignored and pushed to the side. And then there's the conscience, and then there's a voice to that conscience, which is God himself saying, be careful here. It's the fathering voice of God present to every soul that's ever lived. Whether they've ever heard the name God or not, they're walking up the mountains and there's a, a voice in their innermost place. Some people call it their gut. You know what I'm talking about? You hear news and your, your heart sinks and you feel like an ulcer is forming and, and something keeps rolling around in your belly. Somehow you know in this deep theological term we call your knower. You know in your knower. It's deep, isn't it? But everybody knows in their knower. That there, there's a fathering of God. 
And then in pain, there's a shout in the pain in that moment of heartbreak and the, you were the first time, not only that you have a heart broken, but that you've been the perpetrator. When you've been the one that has broken the heart, there is a shout even to you there that there's a better way. And what happens is there's a setting aside of doing what's right in that voice of God's eyes to doing what's right in our own. Deuteronomy, it says, he warns his people, he goes, don't do like you are today. Don't do what's right in your own eyes and set aside what's right in, in, in my eyes. And it does seem that we all seem to realize there's not just a higher standard. Because when we say standard, the, the world is really good at, at calling it a standard as in um, something cruel and mechanical. I, I love it. Uh, this is Mountain Valley, and so uh, there's, uh, you know, however many people are here today. And so if someone comes to the Mountain Valley and they go, Mountain Valley really hurt me, right? And I'm like, like, who's Mountain Valley? I've never met him, you know? Like, have you ever met Mountain Valley? I've, I've not ever met the person. Uh, uh, I, I hear he's a great guy, whoever he is, right? Uh, but, but I've never met Mountain Valley. I know it's not me, and y'all know it's not me. Uh, so who's Mountain Valley? Well, well what will happen is someone will say, well, Mountain Valley hurt me, but, but they don't, it's not actually Mountain Valley, it's Tom. Now, I don't know if there's any Toms here, but for some reason I always pick on Tom, right? There's two names that come to my mind, Tom and Steve, right? So, so it's like, Steve really hurt me. I'm sorry, Steve. It's, I know it's not, it's not Pastor Steve. Our officers are making sure that that was just a, not a big deal gunshot, FYI. Um, Hallelujah. It's good to be gathered for the kingdom of God on a Sunday morning. Hey, there's a cross right here, and if you're not right with God and that gunshot scares you of death, I'm serious. It doesn't have to end that way. Uh, great confidence. Where was I? Tom and Steve. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, someone goes, Mountain Valley hurt me. It's not Mountain Valley. It's it's Tom. And it's really, and what you see is people, they tend to depersonalize anything that has to do with their heart. They try to make it where it's not a person behind the thing. It's a standard. It's a cruelty. They try to take the Father's commandment and make it a cruel rule. They try to take God's protecting of your life and turn it into something called control. They're like, God's trying to control me. He is not trying to control you. He's trying to get you to live another day. When I told my kids, stop, it's not because I was trying to ruin their future. It's because I wanted them to live without burns another day. My, my sweet, beautiful daughter is here, and she's 15, and we all went to the beach, and, and everyone except for me used this expired or, or not expired. It just was defective um, sunscreen. And so she got second degree burns on her nose and on her on her back and, and had to go to the specialist burn hospital and, and look at it just last week or the week before. I can't remember it all blurs together. And we were so concerned, you know, that, that my, that, you know, I, I dared not say it because you like, do, you, here's what happens is when there's a lot at stake, you do not mole on all that can happen because you will traumatize yourself. Uh, this is for somebody. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. He says, and the word for troubled is traumatized. He says, let not your heart be traumatized. Don't mull on what could go wrong in the world. Mull on God, right? So that's for somebody. So as we're thinking of this, I'm thinking, you know, when someone says, you know, go out, you know, and, and the, uh, Micah was the one who showed me that the old Boy Scouts book would tell you how to get a summer tan. And they would say you go out for a few, you know, a half hour without a shirt on for boys, and you go out again. And then eventually you get your summer tan, and you never get sunburned again. Well, you hear those simple fatherings of, of an old man that gives you simple wisdom, and you're like, old man, you're out of date until you get second-degree burns from ignoring that advice. And we didn't ignore the advice. We tried. You see what I'm saying? That is, this advice from God is not, it's more than advice. You don't want to call it that, but it's not him trying to control your life. It's him trying to make you live another day. So we have all of history that erupted and has suffered because so many people have exchanged what's right in God's eyes for doing what's right in their own eyes. And the best example I could give to you 
is uh, a story I heard when I was in high school. If you could have a road that was straight from here to New York City, six lanes wide, only you on the road, and you could have any car you would want, who would have a Tesla? Is there anybody that would have a Tesla? Who would have another car? What would you have? Anybody? What car would you have? A Maserati. Reminds me of a song. Uh, What other car would you want to have? Anybody else? Say again? A Corvette, a Jaguar, a Viper. Ooh, that sounds fun. A 57 Chevy. Yes, sir. A Mustang. Ooh, a Shelby Mustang, probably. Anybody else? (laughs) A Chevy Nova, is that what you said? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or like a Carmageddon. How fun would that be? You know, I'm going to be like, I'll have an old VW Beetle. Yeah, what do you want, Miracle? <laughs> a four-wheel drive one? Yeah, four-wheel drive one, a little bit of lift, maybe a snorkel on it. You can have any car you want. You can have any car you want. And you can drive whatever speed you want. There's no speed limit. And there's no Steves on the highway to pull you over. There's no cops. There's no speed limit. There's no rules. And it's only you. How fast will you drive? 100 miles an hour. Do I hear two? <laughs> yeah? All right. Now, who'd be on a motorcycle or something that would go, oh, yeah, my girl. That's right. Yeah, okay. You could have, would, would anybody go three if they had such a car that would do that? Yeah? Anybody more? And then makes sense. The conditions are right. There's nothing at stake. The conditions are perfect. You can drive. There's no speed limit. Now let's pretend that the only thing that changes is that a speed limit is put there annoyingly out in the, you know, middle. 70 miles an hour. Now, here's my next question. Who here drives the speed limit just because there's a speed limit there? I want to see you. You exist. Ah, uh, yeah. Who, who drives some percentage over that will mean there's no less risk? <laughs> who, who, who will still drive as fast as they feel like? Okay, now that was a trick question. Everybody will drive as fast as they feel like. Whether you drive the speed limit or a percentage over or you fully ignoring it, you are doing what you feel is right. And it makes sense to do so if you're the only one there. Why, why have some? And a lot of people think of the commandments of God like that speed limit that is there for no good reason. And so therefore, when God is slowing down how you regulate your life, it doesn't make any sense. But now let's change the conditions. Let's make two lanes of traffic. Let's go three headed to New York, and let's make it two headed to New York, and four smart people coming this way. (laughs) Right? For the, like the Texas, you know, they're, they're, they're on their way. We hear business is good. We're gone. Uh, so they're on the way. Let's, uh, let's put multiple levels of drivers on that road. Let's put everyone from, from Grandma to, uh, uh, to Ava. <laughs> uh, let's, put, let's put Grandpa uh, and let's put Crazy Teenager. Uh, let's put that 30-year-old who's got nothing worth living for and let's put that... 30-year-old that's got a whole lot he, he's scared of dying for. And you put all these different people on the road. And let's add some hills. Let's add some blind corners. Let's make it not a straight path. Let's put rain. Let's put changing temperatures. Let's put snow in New York. And let's put some weird rainstorms in Texas. And let's put some beady-eyed people in some states in between. Now, now, does it make sense, what do you call it if everybody drives as fast as they feel like? What do you call that? 
Anarchy, I have a very fancy term I call it. I call it la-la land. Yeah, you're living in la-la land. And at this point, a commandment makes sense. To have something that everyone else, if you ignore the speed limit, if everyone does what's right in their own eyes on the road, there's going to be a lot of collateral damage. There's going to be a lot of heartbreak. There's going to be a lot of mamas crying because they lost their boy. There's be grandmas crying and dads crying because they lost their bride. I remember Jonathan, when we were coming to um, over here, he had a... Um, he had a dream, and it was, it was like a, a, a fiery road, and on that fiery road, um, there was smoke in or outside College Station, and he couldn't tell if, if it was a fire because it was in judgment. He couldn't tell if it was a fire because of revival, but one thing he knew was nobody knew what to do. And so, and, and, and he was in his car, and he was like, am I going to get out and help? And he was like, he was like, Inside was like, what am I, of course I'm going to get out and help. It's the right thing to do. I can't believe I'm asking myself if I'm going to get out and help when there's obviously some sort of problem going on. And so we're driving, Jenny and them have moved from San Antonio, and we lived for a couple weeks together in Huntsville before we finally moved over here. And on the way there, there's this car wreck, and there's this mama in a car upside down. Uh, and, and, and she's dying. The car's been put up. This is in true life now. And, and the road's shut down, and everybody is looking at their phones, and no one knows what to do. And Jonathan gets out of the car and goes and grabs this beautiful black woman's hand that has a beautiful wedding ring on it and starts to pray with her as she's gasping and gets ready to die. And nobody knows what to do. And what happened on the road, the reason there was a wreck at all is because somebody was doing what was right in their own eyes. And it's always easy to justify when you don't see the consequences. But I used to do this little example is you have that little pond out there. Some of you boys can go do this after, after church. You got a perfectly clear pond and, and you throw some rocks in it. But let's just, uh, let's just say that your dad asked you to um, uh, stay out of the pantry and don't eat a certain snack. <clears throat> and you, you do it anyhow. You sneak in there and you, you get away with it. The question is, how long does that little doing what's right in your own eyes, how long does it affect the world around you? Have you thought about it? Just a snack, you know. A month, a day, a year, an hour, you know, you feel sick and go to bed. How long does it affect the world around you? Or take another one. Maybe you, um, someone, girls ask you what your name is and, and you don't want to tell the guy because he's kind of creepy and you go, my name is. Tom. <laughs> Thank you. My friends call me Tom. <laughs> so you see that guy at church next week, and he's like, oh, shoot, tell my friends I'm Tom. You know, like, hey, d you know, this guy, I'm trying to chase him away, and he thinks my name is Tom. So, like, how long does that lie about your identity? How long does that, you know, how, does, how long does that affect the world around you? You know, yeah, well, it could be, I don't know, until the guy moves away, or you think about it. Or, I mean, this one is... You sleep with someone you shouldn't, and now you got a baby. That's a little easier. How long does that affect the world? Well, that, oh, well, that one's obviously longer, but and it's hard to see the consequences uh, of of an action because there's so much selfishness around us. There's like a rippled pond. You don't. It's hard to trace how long you influence the world around you. But if I said that the first person was Adam and Eve that was eating something they shouldn't have, and the second person lying was Muhammad. And, and the third person was David and Bathsheba. You begin to see that your life affects a lot more people than you think it does. And it's really hard to see. It's really hard to discern it and decipher it when 
So many people are throwing stones in the thing and you can't, I mean, waves are coming from us at every direction. And you're like, is that mine or is that my mom's or is that theirs? You don't know. And it's hard to take responsibility when the waves, when everything is so turbulent. But one thing I know is that your life matters. And that when God parents you, when he fathers you, it's not just for your life, it's also for others around you. To which we have the great answer. Jesus stepped in when history was at the point where everyone saw, it doesn't matter what we do, as long as we do what's right in our own eyes, we'll continue to make a mess. At that very point, at the right point, Jesus steps in. So that's the bad news. Now we're getting to the good news. The good news is Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Some people think of truth as the commandment, which, which commandments are true. But it's the thing that everyone tries to get away from when they call, instead of calling someone by name, they call it by something impersonal. So instead of calling you know, the guy that hurts you or bless you, Mountain Valley, you just call it, you know, instead of calling it Tom, you call it something else. And here is the truth, is the truth is not something to know divorced from a person. Truth is a person. Jesus doesn't say, I know the truth. He says, I am the truth. The good news is you can be friends with God again. Though man has shoved him out of their lives and tried to do what's right in their own eyes and change what they call him to try to ignore the fathering of God and, and come up with all sort of weasel words to get away from it, that, that God that has been shoved off said, I'm coming and here's the good news is I still want to be friends with you. Amen. But the way that he did it, we see in Philippians chapter 2. It says, Let us, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. It says Jesus became obedient to the point of death, even to the cross. You remember that Jesus is in the garden and he's sweating blood. And he says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. How did Jesus attack the problem of the independent spirit of mankind? How did he attack it? How did he conquer it? How did he diffuse the power of it all? Lauren Cunningham tells us this wonderful thing is that you learn how to fight in the opposite spirit. If the world becomes greedy, you become generous. Here is Jesus, the one who's qualified to do what's right in his own eyes. He says, I'm going to do what's right in my father's eyes. And when he came, he did that thing that you've heard us say before, the declaration of dependence. He's like, I will do what the father tells me to do. And if I don't see him do it, I won't do it. And it's this beautiful, beautiful story of him. And it's, I say story it's history. It's more than a story. It's a true story. It's a real life. But it's a beautiful story of Jesus coming as a baby, totally dependent upon parents that don't really know how to raise him. Then he goes to the temple and asks questions of people that don't really know the answer. And then he goes away to a town that doesn't think that anybody godly could ever come from them. And then he leaves that town and he goes and he gets baptized at age 30 to a man 
John the Baptist who doesn't think that he should be baptizing him. And he's this man who never ever depends on the opinion of man, but he is totally 100% dependent on the mind of God his Father. And he could have said, he said, I could have in one flick called down thousands of angels to help me. But God has said, my Father has said, it's better for the world to see me dying because of dependence upon God than to living by having an independent spirit. Than by doing what's right in my own eyes. And I'm not doing a good job, but you guys help me. Lord, help, so someone help him. God, help him. Help him. Isaiah 53 says, Who has believed our report? It's a prophecy about Jesus. Hundreds of years before he came. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he... Jesus shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Jesus shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or beauty that we should see, uh, or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In the New Testament, when Jesus is healing the sick, they quote this verse. And so this verse is, in the New Testament, a promise that Jesus can heal you, not just when you get to heaven, but for some, perhaps, even this morning. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. We were doing what was right on our own eyes, and we were traveling the speed limit. We were ignoring it. We were causing collateral damage of all sorts. And instead of me getting the spanking that I deserved for my crimes against humanity, he took it. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the due consequence for doing what's right in our own eyes was put upon his shoulders. Ah, For any of you that's lost a loved one in a car crash, or any of you that's lost a loved one because of a cancer, you know what it's like or murder, or any of those things, you know what it's like to lose someone because of people doing what's right in their own eyes. Cancers have multiplied and multiplied. Uh, I say often about the, the, even the nuclear armaments have released into our atmosphere radiations that are known to cause cancer of all sorts. And in the teeth of everybody that die now is the presence of A radiation that wasn't there before the testing of the atomic bombs. Our bodies have stuff in them that is the product of selfishness. Maybe not yours, but generations past. And we suffer. And those ripples that have affected us, we have thrown our own rocks in the water and countless ripples will affect others more because of us. And hell begins to make sense when you think about not just what you've done to yourself, but your crimes against humanity. I remember thinking about, uh, I met a a wonderful lady this morning. Her name is Dory, the name of my mother and my dad, the love of his life. When we lost our, your wife and my mom to, to a drug overdose, it was terrible. And I remember when... people were looking at what our family had suffered and seeing me acting out as a boy. They go, look at, look at what 
The stewards have gone through it. We went to a church, a beautiful church. We, our small groups were called Folds Fellowship of Local Disciples, Sheep Folds. My dad goes, and they go, Lord, would you open a door in Ernie's life tomorrow? And the next day, I accidentally burnt the house down. So they're looking at our family and looking at me acting out, and people are like, oh, no, look at Eli. He suffered. Let him act out. There, nobody blames him. But if you had, if you've suffered, if you have um, lost someone because of a drunk driver, and then you're out there being a drunk driver, do you have more of an excuse to drink and drive or less? And if anybody here has suffered from selfishness, the world around you is trying to get you to believe that you have the right to be more selfish because you've suffered from selfishness. But it's not true. And in our heart of hearts, we know it. That we have less of it if we've complained at all about the travesties of this world. We don't have more reason to think about me first. We have less. Because everyone that does what's right in their own eyes we blame our suffering on them. Why would I then go and turn and do what's right in my own eyes? And then you have Jesus, who didn't ever once do what was right in his own eyes. He went to God for every single thing. And... The Bible says that, well, we'll keep reading. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And here is the key verse for right now. Because he poured his soul out unto death. Jesus poured his soul out unto death. If you look at the last days of Jesus' ministry, he comes to Jerusalem and he goes, Oh, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you to me like a hen gathers his chick. And you sense a, a growing burden on the heart of God, the man God, Jesus. He's looking at everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. And he goes, Oh, how I long to gather you to me. But you wouldn't have me. You preferred to do what's right in your own eyes. And yet even then he didn't quit. And then he comes in and he sees Lazarus. And, and, and he already knew Lazarus was going to die. And he was already planning on, on resurrecting him. But everyone comes out and they're so bothered. And it says, Jesus wept, the shortest verse of the Bible. Why did he weep? It's because you were never meant to die. What we say is normal. Jesus said is very abnormal. And at that moment, he's, his soul is going and he's in the garden and he's sweating blood. And he goes, oh God. If it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Not death on a cross, but I'm going to die right now unless you help me. And so he gets back up with those big sweat drops of blood. And in comes the army and he goes and he faces them boldly. And then he lets them take him. He lets them take him. It's not murder if you let them take you, right? So they're, they want to murder him. But it, he, says, he says, I am Jesus. And they all fall down like, oh, shoot. And, uh, and they get up off the ground not realizing the power. Why did Jesus bring a sword along with his disciples? 
is because it's not surrender if you can't fight for yourself. And he, he, he goes, no, put the sword away, Peter. That's not how we're going to win this. Peter's like, oh, shoot. I thought you were going to stick up for yourself. You didn't. And he goes to the cross not because he didn't want to, but because he preferred to. And then he's on the cross, and he's laboring, and he's breathing. And he quotes, as they're all mocking him and making fun of him, he quotes Psalm 22. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 6, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. Jesus was not complaining against God. He was leading everyone to how you would find the passage. Is The way you would find a passage is you would start off, they didn't have numbers, so you would start off the passage with, with the address, and the address was the first two First couple phrases, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's as if Jesus said from the cross, Psalm 22. (laughs) All those people who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying, he trusted me in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And as they laughed at him and mocked him, God did trust in Jesus. Jesus did trust in God. And then at the moment when it was right, far earlier, it should have taken him multiple days to die, but far earlier, he said, it is finished. What was finished? He had poured his soul out unto death. That was finished. And the man went and stabbed his side and blood and water flowed out. And you can look up the research is that when the peritum carditis, the doctors will know exactly that I said it wrong, but close. When the blood and water separate, it's the sign of a ruptured heart. Jesus literally, not just figuratively, literally died of a broken heart because he refused to depend on what was right in his own eyes. Till the very end, he trusted in what God had said. Now, Jesus is God, and some of you, that right there is far too above you. But in your heart of hearts, there's also whispering right now, that whispering from that voice that has been whispering to you about what's right since you were young. There's a voice right there saying, it's true. You know it's true. That was my son. That was me in human form. I came down, and I resurrected again, and there's a voice inside saying, that's, that's true. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. Matthew 28. The ruler, Pilate, said, What evil has he done? So they said, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult, a tumult was rising, a riot was going to happen, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Imagine, that's what everyone does when they say, let me do what's right in my own eyes. They say, I'm happy to let my children pay the price for me doing what's right in my own eyes. And normally at some point, sometimes it's when you have kids, but at some point you realize what an ugly thing that was. To think about your happiness above anybody else's. To go, I this thing I've been suffering for, I am, the, I, am, I am the one in my own way, highlighting my independent spirit, doing what's right in my own eyes. I have lifted it up. Jesus died, he resurrects, and Peter gets up and preaches the best sermon he's ever preached. And he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly 
But God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And he said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children and all who are far off, and as many as the Lord our God will call. They had this reality hovering over them. They had that innocent lamb. Why a sacrifice? Why, why sacrifice a lamb that seems so cruel? It's not cruel. It's just that we're forgetful. It's just we're used to creating euphemism after euphemism after euphemism. What's a euphemism, you may say? A euphemism is what it's called when instead of saying, I committed adultery, you say, I slept with someone. Instead of saying, I slept with another man's wife, you go, I gave in to temptation. It's this tendency in man to change the name of the action until it no longer bothers us. Until it's what everybody does. It's this tendency to change the labels of the thing that has harmed our conscience. You keep changing it until you just call it, well, I'm only human. And now the very sinfulness we're saying is what God, we're, we're calling it something that's opposite of what God meant us to be. And when you see this lamb that just can't, hurt you (laughs) beautiful little you know (laughs) jumping up (laughs) it comes up and your kids are petting it it's the perfect one it's not the ganky one that's got a bum leg that that you want to sell you know you want to trick a guy at midnight to trade a motorcycle for none of that kind of stuff it's just this perfect perfect lamb it's like the puppy you've been waiting for the puppy that's got the perfect pedigree it, there it is. And then your daddy gets up one day and takes it to church. And your pet, beautiful lamb, it's got this beautiful white coat. When they cut it, that blood just shocks you. And you see that the whimper, the, the helplessness of it all. And then when that final breath leaves, that traumatizes you. It gets stuck in you. And and you think, you go, Dad, why did... And your dad takes you home, and your dad says, Son, your daddy did something that not only did that to myself and my friendship with God, but it encouraged other people to do that same thing. And that little haunting image is there. Except now it's Jesus on the cross. It's a man who healed, fed the hungry, calmed the storms. That man, that even the governor who was sentencing him to death knew that he was innocent and that he was just and that he was good. Even that man said, no, I'll let the people do what's right in their own eyes, even if it costs his life. And that's the power of the cross, is it's meant to haunt you. And, and you look at it, and, and the cross is empty. The, the, we don't have, in our churches, we don't show Jesus on the cross because he's not there anymore. But when you look at the empty cross, that's why we look at the empty cross, is you go, it should have been me. And many people, they're like, man, I haven't been that bad. But if you have an independent spirit, it's only time. And that's the power of the cross. And they were cut to the heart because the good news is Jesus says, you who are weary and heavy laden, almost everyone that's here, Probably, you probably understand something, is you're a big deal. 
You probably live like you're important. You probably think that your happiness is important. You probably will make some decisions today that is looking out for what's good for you. And I want to tell you that as you've done it, we've all felt the letdown from knowing that it didn't work out like what we wanted it to do. And you get weary and heavy laden from trying to solve your happiness by doing what's right in your own eyes. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke, my commandment to you, my fathering of you, the little simple words I say, my yoke, those words for you are easy. That's a good woodworker who knows how to fit the oxen together. They have a little thing that helps them pull the... It's like having, um, it's like having two trucks that are going to pull someone else's tractor out of the mud. they got to drive the exact same speed. And so a yoke is the thing that holds them together. And Jesus says, my yoke won't cause bruises on you. It won't cause blisters My yoke will fit you right. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. In other words, what happens for the person that would be a Christian and do what's right in God's eyes is they have to come to God and start learning what He says is right. And they throw off all their old reasonings. And you're like, where do I start? I'm a messed up schmuck. I don't know where to start. That's a great place to be. You start one verse at a time. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So this morning on this Easter Sunday, when we celebrate not Jesus still on a cross, but Jesus that is no longer on a cross, that the grave was busted open wide. What is the good news? Is the good news is that though we wanted him not in our life, the world wanted to do what was right in their own eyes. Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm going to live among them and show them that I still want to be their friend. And I want to transform their hearts from the thing that will kill them to the thing that will let us live together in heaven forever. Amen and amen and amen. So there's only one way to end a service like today. And that is by declaring our dependence upon God. There's a lot of simple fatherings in the Bible. One of them, it says, bless those who curse you. You may not understand why, but if you do what's right in your own eyes and curse those who curse you, it's going to be a bad future. said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom. Poor in spirit is someone who doesn't think much of themselves. They're like, God, without you, I'm nothing. And you could declare your dependence and say, God, I've, I've been thinking quite a lot of myself in my own eyes and and I'm not poor in spirit. I'm, I'm proud. The Bible says, don't forsake the meeting together. Lord, I don't want to hang out with him anymore. We don't do what's right in our own eyes. We trust the fathering of God. More important, all of Christianity starts by kneeling at that cross. 
and saying, Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And thank you for the blood that was spilled that washes this sinner clean. The communion table will be open. The altars are open. Many of our people are ready to pray with you, pray for you. If you need to get right with God, you can go find a spot over there and just kneel in front of that cross and say, God, change my heart. Forgive me. I'll exchange ownership of my life and I'll trust you. One, one fathering commandment at a time. Amen. Let's stand together.